All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this week's Autonomy Talks. It is a great pleasure today to have with us Dr. Giorgio Ramponi, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the ATH AI Center, working with Professor Niao He and uh, Professor Andreas Krause. So something about Georgia, uh, she received the Master of Science in Computer Science with the Honors Program at La Sapienza, working with Flavio Cherichetti and Alessandro Panconesi. She then moved a bit uh, north, <laughs> let's say, uh, to get her PhD uh, in Information Technology at Polytechnic of Milano, also with Honors. And the research interests lie in machine learning and mathematical modeling with a focus on reinforcement learning and multi-agent learning. And uh, today, she is going to talk about recent results in this direction. And we are all very excited to hear the, the talk and the insights she's going to provide. So without further ado, Georgia, the stage is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that uh, Joy already told everything about me. So as you said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher now at the PHA Center. I joined the group in August. Um, now I'm working more on like on multi-agent reinforcement learning and safe multi-agent reinforcement learning and on uh, some theoretical stuff on universal reinforcement learning. And today I will talk about uh, results that I have doing, that I, something that I did during my PhD uh, that maybe could be interesting also for you um, because we have also some uh, experiments on autonomous driving. So I saw on the website of the group that you are interested in this thing. Um, so, okay, uh, we presented this paper on New RIPS uh, 2020. Um, so I will go ahead and this is a joint work with, with uh, my ex advisor, uh, Marcello Restalli, and with uh, Gianluca Drappo. Okay, so um, I think that the majority of you already knows uh, what is reinforcement learning, but in general, to give some motivation, I would like to have a little uh, small introduction about the topic in general. So um, in general, with machine learning, we want to have something that, that to have autonomous um, Robo or autonomous methods to like to perform some task and reinforcement learning in, in the last years achieves great results in solving some important tasks, as for example in robot robot control, or also in autonomous driving, or also for example in master some famous games, like for example the game of Dota. Um, the problem the problem is that. Uh, in some cases, as for example, autonomous driving, defining the correct reward function is a complex task because it's not so clear what we want, what are like the important factor to take into account and also how to define in the perfect way the reward function that can explain uh, what is the uh, task of uh, driving. But on the other way, uh, on the other side, what we have is that we have some people that already know how to perform this task. In fact, for example, humans knows how to drive. And so the idea is why can why we cannot basically take their knowledge in order to define this reward function. And this is basically what universal enforcement learning do, does. So the idea is to look at people that expert that already knows how to do a task and giving taking their experience we want to like to recovering what is the reward function that they are like optimizing so like the sort of explanation of the task um so um as i said i want to like to give you a little bit of recap or in general or some like uh what is the framework in which we are like we are moving so in uh, reinforcement learning, we are in, uh, in general reinforcement learning is uh, in this framework of Markovian processes. The Markovian process is tuple or uh, that is uh, composed of the state space S, the action space A, a transition model P that I forgot to write here, but is <laughs> this P that basically is a function between a state and action to give another states. So it's the probability to, to go from a state given an action to go to another states. Uh, gamma is a discount factor, mu is the initial distribution, and r is the reward. Okay, maybe it could be like a bit straight, uh, like it doesn't mean anything, but the important thing is that the interaction between the agent and there is, uh, it like it formulates what is the interaction between agent and environment. In fact, 
we have uh, we are this agent that wants to perform a task and what you do what does this agent this agent takes an action a and the environment answers to this action changing the state in which this agent e has uh, going to a new state st and giving to the agent a reward function R, R, R. so basically the agent knows how good is this action depending on this reward um exactly what i said now so then this is the interaction between the agent and the environment and the important things is that uh, what the agent wants to do is that he wants to maximize the, the, cumulative, the cumulative sum of these rewards so basically he wants to uh, find a policy that is uh, giving a state is the like a function that tells you what action to take it is probably distribution of the over the set of actions giving a state and uh, he wants to find the action that it gives you to give him in a, in a new state that is a good one and also with a, a good reward function and uh, for my talk i would like to say that we uh, suppose that the policy is parameterized by parameter theta that is quite common in generating policy gradient for policy gradient works and um, all, all of the policies of the, the agent that can decide are ranked by their expected discount to the return. So basically, the idea is that, as I say, that the agent wants to maximize the expected cumulatives of the rewards, that is like written in this case here. And basically, he wants to like maximize also something that is not the something that is giving one, one, one step, but something that also he can have at, with a lot of steps. And which is the importance basically of the uh, of the sum of the steps is also given by these discount factors because like this discount factor says how important are like uh, next uh, next decision in the in the future decision in the future. So uh, as you can see, uh, it's very important uh, uh, the reward function because basically the reward function express how what is the task that the agent wants to. Um, wants wants to perform. So um, the problem is that, as I said before, there are some some cases, real cases, in which the, the finding this reward function is not easy. And so we want to find a way to uh, like recovering this reward function, and we want to like to leveraging of the expert knowledge in order to recovering it. And so uh, inverse reinforcement learning does exactly this thing. So he wants to find a non reward function that the agent is optimizing, looking at the interaction between the, an expert, so an agent that already know how to perform a task and the environment. So it's like that we are in sort of a multi-agent, so exactly multi, multi-agent, but it's sort of multi-agent scenario because we have an expert and an observer, and the observer looks what the expert does, and from, the, from their, its interaction, he recovers the reward function. And how we uh, do these things because he has access to the interaction between the expert and the environment that are encoded in this way. So basically, he has like a set of trajectories where each trajectory is uh, um, is a set of uh, uh, decisions that the agent uh, decided in that specific state as and s. And so, this, for example, take action A, it will uh, will go to a next state S one, take an action one, and so on. Um, in uh, as is as is common in general in uh, IRL, we assume that the expert is optimizing a linear reward function. That's basically the idea is that you have like these reward functions parameters a parameter omega, and uh, this parameter is multiplied by the uh, feature of this uh, of the state and actions. Um, so uh, after that, uh, so we, as I said. Uh, we are supposed to have these uh, linear reward parameterizations, and why it is uh, like a good way to like to is a, a nicer way to see the the problem because uh, if we then introduce uh, what are the feature expectations, so basically the cumulative sum of the features of the uh, that the agent will take, um, we can then define the expected return that we have defined before in this other good way that is basically will like it becomes the um, uh, multiplication between the, uh, the, um, the parameters of the reward functions so omega with the uh, feature expectations. And we will see why this is um, 
yeah this is good after um but now uh, my the work that i want to talk today to you is uh, in a different in a slightly different setting because in some cases we don't have access to an expert but basically we can only see an agent that is not an expert but an agent that is learning a new task so for example if you think about that we are like we want to know how to play chess and we are looking to people that are like um playing chess so learning how to play chess we want to find what are the rules of chess looking at what at, uh, looking day that they are playing so this could be for example setting but in general I could be thinking about many many cases in which we don't have access to an expert but only we can look at the agent that is learning a new task and uh, as in as in IRL we want to basically we want to recover the reward function but in these cases, we cannot have access to agent that already know how to perform the task. Um, so basically in this case, what we have is that we have access to a data set of trajectories for each like improvement of the, the learning agent. So we suppose we like to have access to this data set where each agent starting to learn the task. And after that, it takes like an improvement step that could, that could if you are like in general familiar with machine learning, it could be, for example, a gradient step to uh, of, of the, fun the function of the expected discount return. And you will have a new parameter, new policy, and you will like take the um, a new data set of trajectory of uh, like of interaction between le the learner and the environment. So uh, in this case, we have like more data, I can say, respect to the inverse enforcement learning setting because but also because the, uh, the setting is harder. So we, for sure, we need more, more data in order to understand what is the, the reward function. This new setting was introduced like in 2019 uh, in uh, learning from a learning paper, so from uh, uh, Jack et al. And um, after that, there are other works that take into account this setting. But uh, respect to our work, this other work, uh, the previous the, the, the study of the art of the art of the art results makes some strong assumptions. As for example, in the first paper, the authors supposed to that the agent have monotonic improvements. That basically what what it means is that at each step the policy is always better than the policy that you have at the step before. Um, and also in other paper, like for example, these ones, they're supposed to have access to a ranking of the trajectories. So basically, if you go, if we go back to this data set, it's like that you inside of this data set, um, inside of this data set of trajectories, you have like a ranking to say what is the trajectory, what which trajectory is better than the other. And it's very like strong assumption and very big knowledge of what is the environment. Um, and in general, these other papers don't have any theoretical guarantees on uh, what is the like the error on the reward function that they are like recovering. Um, I don't think that we didn't say before, but if you, everyone has some questions, please stop me doing also the talk for me, it's not a problem. So, um, going ahead in our work, instead, what the only assumption that we make is that the, we suppose that the agent is optimizing the expected scale to return using the using gradient descent. And this is justified because there are many algorithms in RAL, like for example, policy gradient methods that using basically, uh, sorry, not gradient descent, but gradient ascent, because in general we are like optimizing, so maximizing the reward, the expected scale to return. But okay, I think that everyone understands it. And, uh, and also justified also because other famous algorithm of, of RAL, like for example, the iteration and Q learning, um, have strict, uh, it was proved like recently that this algorithm strict uh, connection with policy gradient methods in the sense that basically they are like in some way they are also following the gradient. So um, now, uh, why I say that basically the way in which like we have rewrite expected discount return is a good way to rewrite it because it's uh, in this way we can like uh, write also the gradient of the expected return with respect to the parameter theta that are the parameter of the policy in this way basically what we have here is that we have the gradient of the feature expectation so uh, is the gradient of the policy with respect to the 
parameter theta of uh, these uh, state deduction features. And this is multiplied by the uh, parameter of omega of the reward. So basically, the parameter omega of the reward is outside this gradient. Um, in fact, these are, as I say, the reward weights. Um, so uh, another thing that we suppose, as I say, is that uh, the gradient, the learner is a gradient the learner. So how is the update rule that is like optimizing is exactly uh, uh, like this. So basically at step T, you have a parameter theta of your policy. And after that, you will take gradient step. So you are like uh, summing with the insert, a certain um, parameter alpha uh, multiplied by uh, the gradient of the expected return. Uh, where alpha obviously is the learning parameter is the learning rate. Um, okay, going ahead. Um, what we have is that basically now, since from this, I think that it could be like quite intuitive how to find this parameter omega, because this parameter omega is exactly what basically is uh, minimizing this delta where this delta is the differences between the parameter theta step t and the parameter theta step t plus one. So you want basically to find exactly this update. Um, and to solve, and the, the cool thing is that to obviously to solve this, uh, this uh, minimization problem, it's quite easy because it's quite, it could be easily solved in closed form. Um, and so it's very efficient to solve this, uh, to find this parameter omega. Um, but one thing that we don't mention is that to do all of these things, we have to, uh, we have, uh, we need to have access to the gradient of the uh, expected scan of the policy of the expected scan to return. But in general, we don't have uh, access to the gradient of the expected scan to return. But we have to estimate it by, uh, by, by samples. So using the trajectories that we have, uh, uh, that we can observe. And how we do, how we can estimate this, uh, this gradient, basically we can use it as uh, some algorithms that are very famous, like for example, reinforce or GPP. But this is, uh, this is cause some errors in our optimization problems because here, basically you don't have like this uh, uh, perfect gradient, but you will have something that is estimated. Um, so uh, a question that is important like to, to ask is how much data do we need to like to have a, a specific errors on the recovery rewards. And what we did is that we analyzed these uh, errors looking at basically the error between the omega parameter of the learner, that is the exact parameter reward weights that we are looking at. So this is sort of the reward function that we are looking at and the reward function set that is recovered by our algorithm. Um, and what we show here is the following is that, okay, I already said this thing, but basically uh, what, we, what we show is that the important thing is that basically we have that these differences, uh, um, we can reduce these differences in two ways. So basically, or augmenting um, the number of uh, trajectories that we have for each data set of basically of improvement of the policy, so each DI, or, in, or basically uh, um, increasing the number of, um, of improvement steps, so M. Um, the important things is that it's not exactly like this. So it's not exactly that we can in, increase or the number of uh, uh, trajectories inside each data set or the number basically of data set. Because we have, like, we have this part that is this intrinsic bias that tells us that basically also if we are like increasing the number of trajectories for each data set, so basically we can like observe many, many iterations between uh, uh, an expert that is not like updating his policy. Um, like um, for example, in the first step, we are like increasing two times the, the parameter R. But also if you are like increasing a lot this thing, uh, we can only the only, the only like our, our only hope is to increase in this n in order to reduce this intrinsic bias, and so uh, what is the basically the idea is that that there are there is a bias in each step that we cannot remove uh, only having more data of improvement policies, mm, and we, yeah, this I think that yeah 
it's quite interesting and we will see like these things also in uh, after that we are like we have uh, some experiments that uh, basically use these theoretical results in order to show that also it happens also in our practice so um, now um, going to a more like uh, realistic uh, scenario when we like because um, as i said now okay we are like we take a step by a step after so we are like we are removing the assumption that we have that the grade is exact gradient but we are estimating the gradient with some uh, algorithm like for example in force um, but now uh, we have also to go more to a realistic scenario in general we don't have access also to for example to the policy parameters of the learner but we have to estimate both policy parameters and the learning rates of the learner looking only at the uh, trajectories and only basically on the data that we have from the interaction between the agent and the environment. And so we needed uh, to estimate them from the data. So the first step is to recovering the learner policies. And uh, uh, in order to recovering the learner policy, we have to what, what we propose, what we propose is not for something that we propose us, but is something very simple. Basically, we are like maximizing the likelihood to have the of a specific parameter theta, and so we are solving the, the following optimization problem. And um, basically, the only thing that we are doing is that we are like behavioral, we are doing behavioral cloning on the policies in order to find the parameter theta that best, best explains the behavior of the agent for each policy. And uh, after that, the most important part and most like uh, tricky part is like that we like we need also to estimate the learning rates. But since we don't know also what are the reward weights, we need to estimate the, the learning rates and the reward weights together. And as you can see, this is a very it's a sort of imposed problem because if you don't know alpha and you don't know omega, in order to minimize this parameter, you can like put together many things. And what we did is like that we use instead block coordinate and descent algorithm in order to optimize it. So our final algorithm looks exactly like this. So um, basically, our algorithm is the following: it takes an input a data set of improvement um, policies so for each d1 di uh, and basically uh, is the policy that the agent is as a step for, uh, pi i and after that after a policy improvement we'll have a d2 with policy pi 2 and so on and uh, what we want like to have in output are the reward weights omega and what we did is the following. We started by estimating the policy parameters using like some behavioral coding algorithm. That's for example, the maximum likelihood that we that showed before. And after that, we started by initialization some way, the parameter learning rate um, alpha and, learn, and uh, the parameter omega. And after that, we computing the learning rates and the reward weights by alternating basically these two minimization problems where the first principle problems as this requirement that the, uh, the half has to be like hidden at some values because obviously the learning rate is positive. Um, and instead the addition problem of the, um, to find basically the omega, so the uh, parameter of the reward weights uh, as not basically a limitation on the reward weights. So the reward weights can be also negative. But it's important to have at least that one of these two minimization problems is positive in order to like to have some guarantees on the convergence. Um, okay, one thing that I want to mention that maybe it could be not clear is that I want to like to repeat that this delta is the differences between two policy parameters update. So this delta t basically corresponds to the differences between uh, the, uh, the policy parameters at, temp, uh, at time t plus one and the policy parameter at time t. Um, okay, going ahead. After that, we like we also did a, um, uh, a theoretical analysis of our algorithm, and what we did is that we uh, suppose that our learner policy is a Gaussian policy, and. Uh, after that, uh, as I say, we perform this fine sample analysis, uh, observing only one step because 
basically this analysis is different from the other because here we are also looking at the fact that we are uh, introducing some errors also during the behavioral cloning step. So we are also during when we are like estimating the learner for the parameter theta. And also, uh, obviously, we have also the errors that we have before. So basically, the error on the estimation of the gradient. And um, basically, what we found is the following. So we have like the differences between the um, reward weights of the learner and the recovery reward weights is bounded by this quantity, where we have the, the important. Okay, these are all. I want to kind to say what are these different quantities, but the important aspect obviously is this n. So basically, okay, this, the first part is the bound of the approximation of our Jacobian. So basically, we have we suppose that the Jacobian of the feature expectation is bounded by this quantity m. We suppose that the state features are bounded by quantity m. It's very normal stuff, and also that the world features are bounded by this other quantity mr. Oh, I'm sorry. And, uh, but the important things to take into account is that basically uh, these errors decreases with the number of trajectories that we have for each data set. So um, basically it's very, if you, if you can, if we go back to basically to what we, to the results that we have previously on the, um, on the error on the, between the recovery weights and the real weights, it's very similar in the bound that we have also previously. If because previously we have also the component on the uh, on the number of uh, improvement policies, but in this case we are considering only one learning step. So basically we are not considering that we have access to more data sets and not only to two data sets of learning trajectories. Mm. There are questions until now, because I will go to the experiments part after. So please, if someone has some questions, please ask me. But uh, otherwise, I will go ahead and uh, uh, maybe we can have a time for questions at the end. Um, so, uh, okay. I think that this, these experiments maybe could be uh, quite interesting because basically what we did is the following is that we are like looking at if our theoretical findings also we can like have some uh, something to see also if they are like correct also in practice. So what we did is the following, we have like this uh, grid word that is a very simple grid word where the agent basically has to go in specific states where the reward function is higher. And um, and what we, uh, what we can show, what, what you can see here is the, is the following thing. Okay, here if we are like, saying that we have access to a fixed number of uh, data set of improvement policies. We are like only increasing the number of trajectories inside each data set. And we are looking at the expected discount return that we have for each of these like in different number of, the, of trajectories. And um, where basically the expected return is computed on the policy that is uh, um, that optimizing the recovery reward function, but we evaluate obviously the policy on the real reward function. And what we can see is that increasing this the batch size, as basically the theoretical, um, theoretical result says, we are like re basically in uh, uh, re removing the error. So we are like increasing our expected discount return. And also, if you're looking at the error between the recovery weights and the real weights, we can see that also in this case, basically the errors goes to zero you know, when we are like uh, max, uh, where like we are aument increasing the number of trajectories. And the same, the same things we can see also, and this is I think quite interesting because we can see the same things also if we are like only. Uh, increasing the number of uh, um, data sets, so number of uh, policy improvements that we can see, and not basically the batch size of each data set. And uh, in general, in the theoretical cell says that we have like this intrinsic bias that we can like not remove, but in the expected return, we cannot see this basically this intrinsic bias because also aumenting the number of learning steps of, that we can see of the agent, we are we can see that we are going to the best expected discount return 
Instead, maybe on the recovered reward, we can see that in this case, in this case, we are not achieving exactly zero, but we are like slightly um, up to zero. So maybe here we can see that we have like this you know, bias that is given by the um, by the R, by basically the number that the number of trajectories is not basically is given by the fact that we are estimating the gradient not in the perfect way. Um, after that, what we did is the following: is that we are like we want to have some experiments that remove the assumption that the agent is following the gradient. So basically, we are like we test our algorithm looking at different learners. So um, basically, an agent that's learning the task, this task on the grid world, uh, we are using Q-learning, another that using soft policy improvement, another that using soft value iteration, and after that, okay, uh, and one that is basically is following the gradient. So we can say that only this one, uh, in reality, respect our assumptions. So the second one, and uh, as you can see. Also, we rather algorithm that basically the, does not forfeit our assumptions because are not like gradient based learner. We can see that also in this case, our algorithm find a reward function that have good performances in expected discount return. Instead, our the other algorithms that the, of the state of the art, at least on one way when we publish the paper, then uh, don't have like this, uh, we like our algorithm performs better than these other algorithms in all of the, uh, with all different learners. After that, we perform also some similar um, experiments on uh, basically on uh, Mujok domains, um, uh, especially on uh, Rich and Hopper. And uh, this is interesting because in this case, instead we can see that we are like removing in some sense the uh, the fact that the rewards is linear in the state and action features because basically um, the uh, rich and hope uh, real reward function is not linear and uh, but we are like we are approximating their their reward function with a linear reward function and also in this case we can see that our algorithm performs quite good so it finds a reward function that basically uh, have a good expected discount return. Okay, here when you were in the basically on the x axis, you can see the number of steps, and the number of steps basically is how many steps we can see about the learning uh, um, of the learning uh, expert. So if you look at the learner, is stopping here. Okay, maybe this is, could be like the most interesting uh, experiments for you. Okay, uh, I want to tell some words about it. Um, this is only in the appendix of the paper, but I think that is quite interesting. Um, we use uh, a, um, a simulator, this Tumo, I think that this is the correct name to pronounce it, but I'm not, I'm not so sure, is a simulator of driving. And basically uh, we are optimizing the, um, the uh, this simulator with, uh, P, uh, with PGP. And uh, what we did is the following is that uh, we are like optimizing. We have this, uh, with this algorithm that is not following the gradient. So it's not a gradient based algorithm. Um, the, um, basically the reward function of the simulator in order to find a good way in order to not, don't basically uh, crash and to, to drive inside the simulator. And uh, what, what we can see is that we recover, there are like, Four different um, features of the reward function. The first one uh, is the crash, so basically you don't want to crash. The second one, you want to be like how much you want to be slow. And the sec and then we have the jerk and send the time on which you're like achieving a specific goal. Um, and the reward weights, if you okay, if you see the reward weights are very close to re the recover the reward weights. So also in this like preliminary results on uh, a domain that is like not real world domain, but something that is like with data that are more like realistic in some sense. Also in, in this case, uh, our algorithm performs quite good. Mm. Okay, uh, in conclusion with this work, 
what we did is that we provide a new algorithm to recover the reward function from a learning agent. So basically, we um, we are in this new setting that the quite is slightly different from the normal setting of inverse constant, le inverse constant learning where we have access to an expert. And we provide some finite sample analysis um, in order to show what is basically the error that we have on the recover weights uh, with respect to the error on the real weights. And in interesting things is how to extend, extend basically our algorithm to take into account also to uncertainty in estimating both the policy parameters and gradient because we are like we are not putting the uncertainty inside the algorithm. And another thing that could be interesting that I didn't write now here, but basically is to like to prove our algorithm also in a real world task. So on maybe on uh, humans that are uh, like. Um, like they are uh, learning you know, a task and could be i think very very cool if we can have access to this data and to prove our algorithm in this case so uh, with this i conclude my presentation and if you have some questions and i would like to thank you again to invite me to have this talk and if you have like some questions i'm very happy to answer to them thank you Giorgio, uh, for the great talk um, in case you have questions, you can unmute yourself and ask, or simply put them in the chat and I will try to read them through. So uh, there is a question in the chat. Or Emilio, you want to go first? Uh, no, 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 somebody already asked a question, please go. Okay, so there is a question which is, when you learn the reward function from an expert, how do you account for undesired behavior that never happens with the expert? So for instance, if you think about driving, an expert will never crash. So how can this be represented in the learned reward if it never happens in your, in your data set? Yeah, this is very, I think that's a very good question in general. I think that is one of the main problem on uh, of inverse enforcement learning when basically you're looking only on agent that is already an expert and that, that does learning a new task. I think that's okay. Maybe crash is a very bad <laughs> example because we don't want to see people that are crashing, I think. But yeah, if you are like simulating the fact also, for example, that you're like, you're learning how to drive in a simulator and not in the, in the real world, for example, when you are learning how to drive, for example, also in a video game, if you think about it, also like in simulator in general, you're it's at the beginning you are crashing. And so is exactly basically what we want to cover also with this work. Because I think that if you have access to some agent that's learning a new task, we can also see and explore some undesired behavior that we cannot see instead if you're only looking at an expert. So I think it is exactly one, like also a motivation for our work. I hope that I answer to the question. Okay. Yes, uh, Amanda says yes. Okay. So any, any other questions? Uh, Doctor, uh, so following up on that question, um, mm -hmm. but aside from crashing, uh, isn't there a danger that um, you only learn the cost function on a subset of the state space in a sense? Or do you have an idea of mm -hmm. states where you know the cost function well and states which you don't really know the cost function well or something like that? Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I think that is pink. Uh, I think that in general is not like very covered in in, general in, in, in batch inverse enforcement learning. So when you like want to like find the reward function from offline data. And I think that is quite interesting because like accounting for the uncertainty on the reward function is very important because as you, uh, as you said, basically, if you like uh, relying only on the data that you have, don't think about that. Basically, there are some things that you are very uncertain. You can like to cover some reward function that is like not very safe. Uh, and maybe uh, and I think that interesting like future work would be also to have something, something that maybe is more active. So maybe to ask to, for example, to an expert or for in, in general to an agent to perform exactly maybe some things in which you are very uncertain 
in order to like to uh, have also some data for these things. So maybe to have like some balancing between the sample efficiency, so on, on the number of data that you want, and the data that you basically need to like to reduce this uncertainty. I think that's it's quite an interesting thing. Okay, also going back to the Sumo example, right? So mm -hmm. is there an assumption that of some, um, in a sense, uniformity in the cost function for all drivers? Uh, okay. Right? So mm -hmm. it may be the yeah. case that different drivers have different cost functions, right? Yeah, I think this, I also also this thing is quite interesting. I think in general because yeah, okay. In this case, we are of only one one driver. So basically, yeah, we don't have this problem uh, at all because we suppose that we have only one on agent. It's only like optimizing where we're function. But we know that, for example, as you say, that in general is not the case. No, because there are like drivers that have different reward function, different interests, very different things that they want to optimize, and maybe someone that is more like. Uh, um, doesn't take into account like the time which are arriving, but is like more want to be more safe and other people that basically doesn't take into account like the safety part, extremizing basically the, the point. But uh, I think uh, for this case, we have, uh, I have another work that basically the idea is that you have access to different like experts. Each expert is optimizing different, can also optimizing different work functions. And so the idea is that you're, Mm, like recovering the weights and also clustering the agent by the reward function. Because in general, in IRL, they suppose this, you suppose that the data be, uh, has from the same, uh, from an expert that's optimizing the same reward function. Because if the problem is not the, the reward function, but the, the agent different policy, I think that is not a big deal in general, because if you have like many policies, you can find all, all, always a policy that mixing the different policies is also an optimal policy. So I think that is more challenging when the, the rewards are different. Okay. Thank you. Good all right, there is another question in the chat uh, from uh, Nick Bira, who says, can you give some insights on how you derive the error bounds? In particular, is there something similar and you adapted it to your problem or you did it from scratch? It is totally new. Okay. Uh, uh, we used uh, some uh, theory on uh, matrix perturbation and basically uh, the other things is like that. Okay. Uh, I can say, for example, something about uh, this one. Okay, uh, the idea here is that, that you have like two errors. The first one is the error on the fact that you are like using a behavioral cloning in order to optimize in the Gaussian policy. So you have like, a, you can like derive some results on the error that you have using maximum likelihood. So it's like that we uh, do some new step, but only on the, uh, on the part that we are basically we are using this Gaussian policy, but there are, some also some results in general for maximum likelihood, not exactly from RL, but for other things. And after that, instead for the fact of the gradient and also for the fact that we are like, we have these matrices that are like um, some errors, we use also some, like I say, results on matrix perturbation. If you are interested, I can give you some references uh, and also I think that I don't think, and also in the paper there are more, <laughs> there are more like, uh, um points on the on like on the stuff that we use but these multi perturbation things are very old results and we like we we use some of the results also here so there are i can see some things that are new but we are relying also on uh, very well-known stuff all right great um any any final question Right, doesn't think so. Uh, thank you very much, Giorgio, for the great talk and the great discussion. I wish you good luck for, for the next steps. Thank you. Thank you again to invite me. And uh, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for participating. See you all next week for the next autonomy talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye.